I'm going to kick this off, and I know more people will be coming into the room, um, and so we'll just welcome them as they do. Um, welcome back to another session of Ask the Doctor. My name is Michael Hebb, and I'm the founder of EOL.community and Death Over Dinner. And today we get to spend half an hour with my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Gabor Mate. Thanks for being here, Gabor. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Michael. Um, so you talk a lot about trauma, addiction, and the toxicity of our culture, but you were in fact trained and practiced as a palliative care physician um, and worked in that field for quite a while. I'm curious why, because a lot of people that are here today are um, drawn to the work around end of life. Why were you magnetized to work around end of life? Well, you know, it's one of those things, Michael, where it just happened my way. I was walking down the corridors of Vancouver Hospital, which is a major hospital here in Vancouver, BC, and um, the head of the palliative care unit saw me and said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. Would you like to take over? And that, <laughs> that's so I don't know what he saw in me because I wasn't trained in palliative care, you know, but I trained on the job. And for seven years, I was the medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital. We were Canada's largest in-hospital hospice, a 17-bed unit. We had a ward to ourselves. And our mandate was to look after people who were terminally ill, uh, in whom the diagnosis was beyond the capacity of the medical system to offer any kind of cure who may have shorter or longer periods of time to live. So sometimes people came in for respite care or to have their symptoms um, brought under some regulation and then would go home again. And of course, often they'd come in for terminal care the last days or perhaps weeks of their lives. And uh, even though I hadn't consciously chosen the work, it, was, it remains in my medical history some of the most profound and 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 um insp inspiring and exciting endeavors that i ever undertook and i i just learned so much doing that work about life about death about people about myself about the nature of the illness so um it it's not that i i came into it trained but i it trained me over the years yeah well let's I would maybe at, at the close, we'll go back to some of your key takeaways from that work and maybe how it led to the work with addiction. Um, but since we're gonna talk a bit about trauma today um, and you have a very powerful definition of trauma, which I'd love to start with before we start um, going down into grief and end of life. Sure, sure. So let me preface that by saying that this will be a surprise to some of your listeners, but those people that die relatively young, you know, before old age takes them, who they die of all kinds of illnesses, particularly malignancy is what we usually see. Trauma is always in the background of their disease. And that trauma would then show up as they were dying. Um, that's a mouthful to say, and people won't immediately understand why I might have said it, but I just have to own and that was my experience and that was my observation. So what trauma is. Uh, so trauma, it comes from a Greek word for wound. It literally, it means a wound. So trauma is a wound. It's a psychological wound. Now, people often think of trauma as the terrible things that happen to human beings, such as abuse or neglect or sexual exploitation, um, a rancorous divorce, violence in the family, a parent dying, a war, a tsunami, you know, these terrible things that happen. Or a disease like a childhood polio, for example, you know, but those are not the traumas. Those are the traumatic events that cause the trauma. The trauma is not what happens to you. The trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. So the trauma is the wound that you sustain. So trauma is a wound that you sustained that hasn't healed. Now, if you look at, and literally again, the word comes from wound. Now, if you look at what is the nature of a wound, well, and a wound has two ways to look at a wound. 
when is if it's an open raw wound that hasn't healed you touch it it really hurts so the analogy i use is if everybody watching just tap themselves on the shoulder right now you would feel no pain at all but if you imagine your shoulder being bare and there's a raw wound there but the nerve endings close to the surface and you touch the wound with the same force he would hurt terribly so somebody who's traumatized you touch them this much they're in deep pain somebody who's not traumatized they don't feel much even though the external stimulus is the same so trauma then is an open wound that hasn't healed from something from some injury that happened a long time ago and i'm talking about childhood so that's one aspect of the nature of trauma but the other aspect of the nature of trauma is that you can form a scar tissue a scab over it now what's the nature of scar tissue you don't feel the pain but it's rigid it doesn't grow and there's no feeling in it because no nerve endings in it so these traumatic wounds they keep us from growing they keep us from feeling they keep us from um, being present to what's actually going on and so trauma has a number of impacts the major one is a disconnection from oneself and there's a good reason for that so that if you're a small child and if you're being hurt or in a just in a stressful circumstance to feel all that emotional pain and fear if you're alone with it is unbearable for the child so the disconnection from the body and from feeling and from the self is actually a protective mechanism but that disconnection creates all kinds of problems later on so it's, a, it's in the nature of traumatic adaptations that they help you at the time but become source of problems later on so the first thing is this disconnection the second thing is that um, our early experiences shape or determine how we see the world so right now you can see how much mistrust there's in the world right now if you look at the covid situation there's so much mistrust now i'm not speaking of whether or not people choose or not to choose this particular way of dealing with it vaccine i'm not addressing that i'm talking about all the mistrust around it well there's two reasons for that mistrust one is that pharmaceutical companies and governments they have done a lot to earn mistrust over the years let's face it but there's a deeper basic mistrust that some people have which is a result of childhood trauma because their caregivers didn't take care of them so they don't trust the world to take care of them so there's a basic mistrust that happens with trauma um trauma determines your view of the world so and and i've often said this the the buddha said 2500 years ago that with our minds we we create the world so the kind of world that our mind projects is the kind of world we live in so if i live in a world which i believe to be dangerous hostile competitive if i believe that my friends are after my house and my wife and my wealth and these are my friends i'm going to be defensive i'm going to try and make myself as big and aggressive as possible In other words, I'll be president of the United States because Donald Trump said that that's how the world is. I just quoted him. These are your friends who are against you. Now that's the world I live in. That's the world I'm going to create. Now we know the trauma that he had as a child. He had terrible trauma as a child. I'm not blaming him. I'm saying that's the worldview he developed as a child. He couldn't have helped it in the home of a very hostile and belligerent patriarch. His brother. drag himself to death when he was 41 years old so trauma shapes our view of the world now if on the other hand if i believe that the world is basically benign i can trust it i can relax i can trust other people i live in a very different world so trauma misshapes our 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 view of the world trauma also leaves us with pain which then we have to soothe and there's all kinds of ways that people soothe their pain addiction being one of them is not the only one um trauma even interferes with the development of our brain circuits so 
trauma has multiple implications, but basically it's a wound that in one sense hasn't healed, in another sense is scabbed over, so it interferes with our growth, our development, and our capacity to feel. That's what trauma is. Yeah, that's, thank you for that. And I'm sure that many people are writing furious notes and <laughs> rethinking a lot of things. Um, we've started to talk about trauma-informed care, um, yeah. which I think is essential. Um, and But you've also worked, since you've left palliative care, you've worked with a lot of people that have had terminal diagnosis, that are dealing with a later stage cancer, that are very close to the end of their life. And you've worked with them with plant medicine, um, with, in, with compassionate inquiry. How do you think trauma informs our reaction to a terminal diagnosis or our end of life? Well, let me give you two examples. Um, I mean, that depends on, uh, depends on the individual. Uh, I'll give you three examples from palliative care days. One was a woman who was dying with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And she was a, a dancer and, and uh, she found that she couldn't move on the dance floor the way she, her body just wouldn't obey her. And she was diagnosed with ALS. And um, I, I looked after her for the last, she was in her forties. Um, I never forget her beautiful black hair and blue eyes. And um, she told me, and when you listen to people as the, in their dying days, you learn a lot. And she had never been listened to by anybody. That's part of the problem. And she told me that all her life, she used to have a dream that she was buried alive in a box and nobody could hear her or see her. And she was totally isolated. And this is a recurrent dream that she used to have. When she went to the office of the ALS Society to get some support after her diagnosis, there was a poster on the wall that said, having ALS is like being buried alive. Her very worst nightmare came through in the reality uh, by means of her illness. And there are psychological reasons for that, I would say. I'll tell you another case. Um, this man was dying of cancer, I forget which type. And he was the president or the, the co-owner of a company that sold shark cartilages for treating cancer. There used to be belief for a while, a few decades ago, that shark cartilage somehow treated cancer. And so he kept, he was dying, he knew he was dying, and he kept eating this stuff at the, at the hospital. It smelled terrible. You, you, you know, you got, you got up the elevator, and the stench of the shark cartilage from his room would just assault your nostrils as soon as you entered the ward. And, and I had these conversations with him, and I asked him, I said, well, how does that stuff taste like? He says, it's horrible, I hate it. And I said, well, do you believe it's going to help you at this point? He says, no, I don't believe that anymore. But my partner, my business partner, will be so disappointed if I stopped eating it. This man, all his life, could never say no. Always trying to please other people, in my view, that's the reason he developed cancer. And I could say much more about that. I'm not just making this up. There's all kinds of science behind it. Uh, but this is what you find out about somebody. You, you know, what they bring to their death is what they brought to their lives, unless they wake up, you know? Um, I'll tell you a third case of a relatively young man with um, cancer of the testes, testicular cancer. And that's a cancer that we're pretty good at treating. And the doctors had told him that there's a good chance they could cure it. He refused it. 
And they, they, they called me to come in to see if I could get him to change his mind. And, and we went through all the medical facts. And then he told me it's because he had this religious belief that God has, he belongs to a particular congregation. He believes that God has sent him a cancer. And if God wanted him to die, who is he to go against God's will? I said, well, is it also possible that God also created the doctors that created the treatment that could possibly heal this cancer? That meant nothing to him. The elders of his congregation told him that there's nothing about his religion that dictated that he should die like this. But he was absolutely convinced this man just wanted to die because he, he, he was experiencing his life it's so difficult. It was, in a sense, it was a medical suicide is what it was. And again, it's manifested so much about his life. Now, I'll tell you one final case, because you asked about psychedelics. This is another man with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a kind of a degenerative disease of the nervous system, usually fatal. But you know what? There are exceptions. Sometimes people even recover, which is amazing. This has been, this is in the medical literature. Well, this man was in his 60s, diagnosed about two years earlier. His type of ALS didn't paralyze his body. It paralyzed his vocal cords and his swallowing mechanism and, and so on. And so he, he came to a retreat that I led and I was working with a psychedelic plant called ayahuasca. Um, and, um, he came and he said, uh, and in my new book, I write about this case. He said, um, I'm here because I want to live. He could, he could have difficulty speaking. Now, people with ALS, they have certain personalities. This is well known. And their personalities, they repress their anger. They don't ask for help. They're very self-sufficient and very controlling that's how they survived their childhoods this man was like that he, he met every psychological criteria he did these uh, psychedelic ceremonies <clears throat> three of them and a lot of sharing a lot of integration a lot of uh, processing of his emotions he had intimate conversations with this group that was part of the retreat such as he's never had with anybody in his whole life at the end of the retreat, he said, in a much stronger voice, he said, when I began this, I said I wanted to live, and I thought I wanted to live longer. He says, not anymore, he says. When I say I want to live now, I mean that I want to live every moment that remains to me as fully alive as possible. And he had a wonderful year and a half left of life. His family was so grateful. He was so grateful. He died according to his prognosis. But the end of his life was completely different than it was before his awakening. So these are four stories from dying people of what can be learned. Yeah, and but, all of, and all of it goes back to childhood trauma. Well, I would love to do a whole session on um, the connection between trauma and disease. But um, remind me, is it when the body says no? The book is when the, the book where I lay, lay out all this stuff was published 20 years ago. It's called When the Body Says No. Yeah. The relationship yeah. between disease and, and, uh, and a lot of what went into that book was what I learned in palliative care, not exclusively, but, but also in palliative care. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of people's, um, you know, ears picked up when they heard of, you know, about that connection because it's, it's controversial and hard for people to hear, but also incredibly well documented. Um, yeah. Your, yeah, in that book um, and many of your other talks on the topic but so we talked about some extreme cases around end of life um and there's there's questions rolling in about ayahuasca and plant medicine yeah, yeah. Um, you've also seen people change their perspective um about death and their basic anxiety about end of life through plant medicine and also just compassionate inquiry I'm wondering if you can speak to that well, before I go to plant medicine, let me tell you another case from palliative care. A woman dying of cancer. And uh, we had an IV, she was still getting an IV infusion. 
she had trouble eating anymore, drinking, but we're giving her IVs. That was extending her life. And my approach was always not to impose my anything on anybody. It's sort of their choice. And she had, been a, she had been another one of these people that has always been a people pleaser and she could never say no and has always wanted to do what other people needed her to do. And I asked her, well, do you still want the IV? And she said, no, I'm only doing it because my daughters can't accept my death. And I said, okay, what would you like to do? She said, if I had my brothers, I'd remove it. I said, listen, I'm your doctor here. I'm not your daughter's doctor. I'm here to serve you. What do you want me to do? She says, I want you to take it out. I invited the, doc the daughters to come in to speak with me. They hated me. They just couldn't accept it. I said to them, look, I'm sorry, but again, I'm not your physician. I'm your mother's physician. This is her desire. This is what she wants. This is her life. This is her death. This woman learned that she can actually be herself before she died. She could actually assert what she wanted. She didn't have to live or not die. I mean, it only would have been a few days difference. But, but for her, it was so important that she finally does what she wanted to do. So she gave up all her anxiety about pleasing others. And about... And she regained her power to choose what she wanted, even if the only power she had left was to, was to choose the manner of her dying. And she died much stronger and happier. The daughters continued to hate me. Years later, they still hated me, but that's the cost. Sometimes you have to be the bad object. <laughs> you have to be the bad guy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, end of the life of anxiety and, and, and psychedelics. I haven't done that work, uh, but they've done studies at Johns Hopkins in the States using magic mushrooms or psilocybin for end-of-life anxiety. Now, the question you have to ask is, why do they have to do it for end-of-life anxiety? You know why? Because they can get approval for that. Because the, 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 you know, the, uh, the authorities, such as they are, they said, well, these people are dying anyway. What can we lose? But really... There's nothing specific about, about this study and end of life anxiety, it's just about anxiety. And they found that people had these experiences with terminal disease, and they were much less anxious about dying. They had a much better quality of life for their, whatever time remained to them as a result of these psychedelic experiences. So those studies have been published. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine just anecdotally being around people doing you know different plant medicine you see that their relationship changes as well i mean i have well yeah and the relationship primarily to the, i think as you suggested earlier their relationship to themselves changes so we all we all grow up with these identities and um <clears throat> one of the things that happens around death is people start questioning their identity in other words they start questioning who they thought they were um I can tell you another story, um, if I can interject a profanity into this conversation. Um, Please. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a woman I spoke to, uh, was diagnosed, no, she's died since. Um, this is in my new book. She was diagnosed 20 years ago with uh, breast cancer that had spread to her bones. And they, they gave her she had two small boys, age four or five, something like that. The doctors, this, she goes to see this doctor, this oncologist, and the doctor says, well, with treatment, you might have two years at the most. Those are the statistics. And she said to him, fuck your statistics. <laughs> I got two young boys to bring to manhood. I'm not leaving till I do. And when she told me the story, I said, you know what? Great. I said, that fuck you probably saved your life. And it did, because we know that the suppression of anger undermines the immune system. And, it, and, and when people experience their healthy anger, it actually strengthens the immune system. I'm talking about healthy anger. 
So she lived another 20 years after this two year prognosis. It caught up with her. It sped through the bones. And by the time I was speaking with her two years ago now, she only had maybe a year left to live. And as I was writing her book, she died. But she said, I always want to find that doctor and write him because I want to tell him that one of my boys is on the dean's list at the university and the other one has already graduated and I made it, she said. So her confronting the possibility of her dying actually caused her to regain her authentic strength in the face of the disease. And what changed there, just as you suggest, is her relationship to herself. She was no longer this pleaser, this uh, I'll go along with authority every time. She became a very strong, assertive person. And so, and, and, and there's a book called Cured by Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. <clears throat> Jeffrey's a Harvard uh, psychiatrist and physician. This book came out last year. And this is about people who beat terminal diagnosis. And, and, and there's another uh, psychological, oncological psychologist called Kelly Turner, or a book called uh, Radical Remission. And both Kelly and Jeff found, just as I found, that the people who do better or do well in the face of terminal diagnoses are the ones who reconfigure their identity, their relationship to themselves. So they find out that who they thought they were is not who they were at all. I mean, my takeaway from this chat is that our pain and our suffering and our disease to some extent can be seen as an invitation. Well, absolutely. And, and uh, there's a, you might have heard me quote uh, one of my um, mentors, um, whose name is Hamid Ali, although he writes up to the, under the name of, um, of, um, A.H. Almas, and uh, let me quote you something that he, that he said that I, I just think is so true. And it's all about the fact that as a physician, I was trained to see disease as something to get rid of, as an enemy, to fight the war against cancer, you know, battling cancer, battling a disease, this war metaphor, military metaphor. Well, fair enough. Nobody wants to be sick. And I'm not against, I'm not a doctor. I'm not against medical treatment. And they can perform miracles, can't they? But, there's, but at the same time, we can, we don't have to just hold a unit. We, we can hold a more integrated view, which also sees the disease as um, a potential teacher. What is it telling me about my life? And so here's Almas talking about not disease, but difficulties in general. He says, your conflicts and all the difficult things in your life, the problematic situations are not chance or haphazard. They're actually yours. They're specifically yours, designed specifically for you by a part of you that loves you more than anything else. That part of you that loves you more than anything else has created roadblocks to lead you to yourself. It will go to extreme measures to wake you up. What else can it, it'll make you suffer greatly if you don't listen? What else can it do? That's its purpose. And so I've known a lot of people, Michael, who have taken illness, not that they succumb to it or they, they surrender to it and let's just have it have its way. No. But I also use it as a teacher to wake up. Why did this come along right now to teach me something? And I've seen people do that even in the face of death. And it, it means that they're dying. It, it turns out that how you die has very much to do with how you live. And so that even if you have a terminal diagnosis, how you live and how you relate to yourself will have a huge impact on the quality of that life that remains to you and, and how you die. If you, if you are willing to learn from your process. Absolutely. Well, and we're at time, um, but I want to just thank you immensely. You're in the middle of an incredibly busy um, second launch of The Wisdom of Trauma. If people have not seen it, it's an extraordinary film. 
Um, and there, it's in a rolling release right now. Just Google the wisdom of trauma. And finishing your next book, um, there are so many questions we didn't get to, of course. Um, well, Michael, let me let me ask you something. Are you time limited, or are you concerned about my time? I'm concerned about uh, oh your time. Well, we can continue to go if you have time. Okay, well, why don't we, if there are questions from the audience that you'd, that you'd like to bring to me, I'm happy to take them. Okay, great. Well, um, I think this is a powerful question. Thank you, Gabor. Um, yeah. So you let me know when you've got to go. Um, uh, from an anonymous attendee, my father recently passed away. His passing has endured so much trauma in my family. It is overwhelming. I consider myself someone with a reasonable amount of tools, but this feels so big and so painful that all we can do right now is take space and not speak. I don't know how to take a step towards healing and repair. How do we navigate trauma that exposed on earth around the loss of a loved one? Yeah. So I often saw in palliative care that the death of a loved one exaggerated divisions in the family. Is that what this question relates to? Yeah. Um, that had been kind of papered over, but the facade just broke open. And let me tell you something interesting as well. Um, what I saw in palliative care is that sometimes it was the adult children who had the most difficult relationship with the parent who was dying, who had the greatest difficulty letting go. And the children, and by the way, no two children have the same family and no two children have the same parents. Nobody grows up in the same family because the parents relate differently to each child and, and all that. But the point is the children who are genuinely closer to the parent had the most ease accepting the death. Why would that be? You think it should be that way around. But the reason is, is that the people that had the difficult relationship with the parent had already lost the parent when they were children. They lost that connection. And losing them again brought up all that pain, which they mm -hmm. weren't ready to face. So that means that around the death of a parent, everything that happens in a family becomes exaggerated. Now, I would say to this questioner that you need to work on your own healing first. Because only from, a, if you can reach out to the rest of the family, if this is available, if they're open to it, then that's great. Then you can say to them, look, this death revealed to us just how much trauma we're still carrying. Shall we engage together with some expert guidance on a group healing process? You can do that. But if that's not available, you don't have to wait for the whole family to come around. You can begin to work on your own healing. And if you do, at some point, you'll be able to approach the rest of the family from a more healed place, from a more whole place. And then you might have some success in reaching them. So I'm saying if, that's, if the whole family is not available now, you're available. Work on yourself. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, so there are a uh, one question that is um, just very straightforward for your um, the AA Abbas. Can you spell and then maybe where the source of that quote was? Yeah, give me a second, okay? Yeah, of course. The writer is A.H. Almas, A-L-M-A-A-S. This is the book. It's called Elements of the Real in Man. Elements of the Real in Man by A.H. Almas. It so happens that Almas and I are doing a six-week program right now, we, uh, which began, it, it's probably a bit too late to join now, but I don't know, but you could look, look it up. It might not be. Um, him and I talked just on... Sunday together for three hours, and we'll continue to do it for another four weeks. What's the name of the series? And congratulations, how excited to be working with your mentor. Well, it's great, I, I was terrified, but actually it's, I just bring myself and he brings himself, you know? 
is 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 a spiritually very advanced man um but i know a few things too so i'm not i'm not i'm not as intimidated as i as i thought i might have been but it's wonderful uh you know what i don't know what the name of the program is because who keeps track i just show up and they say talk and i talk so uh <laughs> but you well, can well, find if you yeah. google both of our names i'm sure or stephanie my manager could send you the link michael if you want yeah, and we'll send it out to people because I think that they would really appreciate that. With we're not going to get to all the questions, but I will get. Let's end with one. Um, sure. And we've talked a lot about um, trauma and its impact. Um, there's a very straightforward question: is How do we begin to heal our trauma? Well, you see, as soon as you're asking that question, you're already on the right track because. Um, because in that question, there are a number of implied attitudes. Number one, you may think you hate yourself, but if you didn't love yourself, you wouldn't ask that question. Because you only want to heal somebody that you care about. So that's a great beginning. Secondly, at least you believe in the possibility that, it, that healing exists. That means you're not totally hopeless. Even though it may feel hopeless to you, you're not hopeless. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking that question. And number three, you're willing to accept guidance. Those are three wonderful places to begin. Now, how do you do it? <clears throat> There's my program, Compassion Inquiry. There's Peter Levine's Somatic Experiencing Body Work. There's EMDR. I won't explain it, but it's capital EMDR. There's, there's the work of Bessel van der Kolk and his wonderful book, The Body Keeps the Score. There are my books. Um, there's a lots of, there's, there's hypnosis, there's psychedelic work, there's body work, there's cranial sacral work. There's a lot of modalities out there. Just don't look for it within the medical profession. Physicians are good at the biological aspects of disease, but they're not trained beyond that. I know that because I'm one of them. So um, look outside the medical model for healing, therapy of all kinds, all those things that I mentioned, spiritual work, meditation, yoga, all of those things. There are plenty of pathways. Yeah, but I think the important thing to underline is you've already begun when you start asking that question. Exactly. Yeah. That's a powerful thing to take away. I think we need to take your um, modality of trauma-informed care and apply it to hospice um, and to palliative care departments all over the country or world, um, and also grief. Um, so I might bug you about that. <laughs> bug me sometimes. <laughs> My, it's always a pleasure to be bugged by you. Let me put it that way. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gabor. Um, and everybody, make sure that you um, watch all of Gabor's talks. Go back and buy every single book. They are, even though one may say it's about ADHD, you're going to learn about the human condition in a powerful way, even if you don't have ADHD or if you don't think you suffer from addiction. You do. Um, and you're going to learn a lot in, in the realm of hungry ghosts. Um, and go watch Wisdom of Trauma. Thank you, Gabor. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Michael. Take care. You all love.